Canopy growth shares on a high. I, I'll be relieved when we stop using the puns here. The world's largest publicly traded cannabis company is up the most in nearly four and a half years as Corona beer maker Constellation Brands makes a $3.8 billion bet on the budding grower. Of course, that is an increase of its stake. It already had about an 8% stake. The price represents a 51% premium to Canopy's closing price on Tuesday. And I'm pleased to say that Bruce Linton, Canopy Growth CEO, is here with me now. As I said, I guess it'll be a sign of the maturity of the industry and maybe of us too when we stop using the various pot puns. Well, you know, it, it's one of those topics. Everybody wants to approach it, but we're not sure how. And so um, that's why these puns come out. And I, I probably didn't help things much because when I began the business, I bought what used to be the Hershey Chocolate Factory for all of Canada about 500,000 square foot building. And I can tell you that you should not explain that the reason you began on that platform is because you wanted to know why the Oompa Loompas were so happy. Uh -oh. But <laughs> what happens is if I open with that line, you relax and ask me questions. Right. And this business is about taking people on a fact-based journey. It is not about selling bud. And so when I'm talking about medicinal marijuana, I wanna know what your ailments are, what indications you think you're, you have, and what medicines you use, and which ones we can disrupt. And so uh, that's the medical side on the recreational beverage and adult access, uh, the reason we like working with Constellation is we looked at the other players and we thought who's aggressive, entrepreneurial and sees the future and it was them. And so when we make a beverage that has no alcohol in it but no calories, causes Friday night to be uplifting, positive, uh, you don't get sleepy, you get happy. If I can make that and make it with them and make it consistent, well-branded, delivered to you for the type of purchase you want and different demographics fit in, mm -hmm. that's the future. And so the reason I liked uh, Constellation is they saw that way before anybody else. And where are you in that process in terms of the beverages? So we've uh, been in Canada where it's federally legal, uh, producing in several million square feet and have labs that have been making and testing and stabilizing this sort of beverage platform for several years. We can't yet sell it in Canada. That's coming in the last half of next year is the expectation because as you probably know, we have this medical market with about 350,000 people and October 17th, you can go to stores or sites and buy products from the federal and state governments uh, legally just because you're over 19. That system is gonna allow us to, in the future, bring more products forward and that's where Constellation in the second half of uh, 2019 should see a lot of their expertise go. And is that also where the capital is going to be deployed? Will it be mostly on production? Will it also be perhaps poised to expand more in the United States if we see more, more legal movements here as well? How are you all gonna spend the money? So there's about three buckets, if you will. There's the expansion vertically in Canada because that market's the most advanced, most structured. And it's sort of like a sandbox. What works there? If I can create a sleeping aid that works on Canadians, I bet it works on Germans and the German market's open. The second bucket is globally, there are now 29 countries in the world that have a federal system to govern this. And in many of them, it is a socialized medicine model, say Germany. So last quarter, we saw continued growth of our sales in Germany. What I would expect is that becomes sort of the second bucket. And then the third is, if and when it becomes federally legal in America, state by state or at a full level, we have a whole bunch of products prepared and optionality to come in with the final tranche of money and be dominant. Let's take a step back for a minute and talk to me a little bit about the business model because you're talking about um, being a recreational beverage and product company. You're talking about being a potentially a medical company as well. Um, where are you on the retail side and how, I mean, you know, it's a bit tricky when you're a pharmaceutical company essentially, yeah. but also providing a recreational product. Yeah, it is tricky. So the reason it's tricky is prohibition is a funny thing. When things are prohibited, people can't use them. And so what we do is we grow the plants. Then we either sell that finished product, which could be dried cannabis, or more increasingly what's happening is we extract from it the active ingredients. And now you're talking about milligrams, not grams. And what you want to do then is fraction each of those milligrams down because there are about 80 different, 90 different cannabinoids. And now you can say, am I mixing these together to cause a sleep outcome, or am I putting them together to be a beverage? And so you can sort of see that the line isn't at the plant and it's not at the extraction, it's the science and processes. Now, when you take that ingredient and you want to run it down a bottling line, that's a different outcome than when you put it into a GMP Pharma One facility making a gel cap or a hard pill. And so we move up to there. I suspect what you'll find over time is, why do we own the production assets? Maybe three or five years from now, we'll put those into a REIT, pull more of the money back up to the top, 
And uh, there's lots of people happy to make 7% if they have a great offtake with a partner like us. And do you own the land on, on which you're growing also? I, I go from the seed to the storefront. And it's quite remarkable because um, you can understand why places like Lululemon or Apple can have so many people working in a store and charge you so much, but you come back. What we're trying to do is, as prohibition ends in any country or whether we're allowed, is to have the retail so we can educate and build the brand and try to have the medical where we go right to the end patient so we can actually get all the details of the indication. So we have about 85,000 medical patients certified by the federal government that are our customers. So when we want to run trials, we just go down the list and reach. Mm -hmm. And so, as you see it, is that where the competitive advantage comes from? Because essentially, when you think about marijuana, like you think about any crop, it's a commodity at For the sure. end of the day. So, does the differentiation come from, I mean, do you patent these medical uses, for example? Yeah, we have. Um, so, you, I would call it a commodity is something you and I can compete growing wheat. That's a commodity. This is more like a regulated ingredient. But the ingredient value will go down. What you want to do is increase what you make with the ingredients. Right. And so uh, that's what we do. We've got 39 patents, for example, filed against certain indications like insomnia. And we have a bunch of background patents on how you create uh, those outcomes. And so the advantage that Constellation stepped into with us is when you're running this for a whole country and when you're in 11 other countries, you know scale. And scale changes everything from how you farm to how you extract to how you think about a bottling line that can serve a whole country versus how do you pack stuff on a kitchen table. And the evolution of cannabis has been limited in the U.S. because of the absence of a federal program, which is not the same as in Canada or Germany and the other opening markets. So I think we'll be in great shape if and when the U.S. opens. When are you guys going to make money? You just um, uh, With this announcement today, you also announced that uh, your profit, your latest yep. earnings report, and you had a wider than estimated loss uh, from analysts. So what's the outlook there? Well, probably uh, two-thirds of our loss were things like uh, put options. So they weren't really, you know, they're the accounting losses versus the actual business. We've gone from zero customers on April 1st, 2014, to 85,000 now in medical. Uh, there are about 35 million people in Canada who can access the product October 17th. Every state or province, as we call them, has selected us to be on the shelf. About 35, almost 38% of the inventory that's been called will be ours for the whole country. Uh, I believe it will be unavoidable to make a profit under those circumstances if execution against the opportunity goes as it would. And that's why we built a business. Why would I want to win the warm up? Great. Uh, that, that, that wouldn't be prudent. Just very quickly, when you talk about the different provinces in Canada, they have different regulations. Um, Ontario just came out with its rules that it'll, first it'll be online only, and then there will be private retail sales not until April 1st. This was a bit of a disappointment. So how do you, how do you navigate all of this? Well, it, it's a short-term disappointment. I guess if I wanted to make money like in the next day, um, that's a different thing. But what the province had were, there's a provincial warehouse that will bring the product in, and then they were going to have about 30 stores for the biggest province in the whole country. Well, that was going to be very insufficient and poor. So the, the new government said, that's not going to work for us. We're going to pause, and we're going to let the private sector build out, and they'll probably have three or 400 stores a year from now. And that will mean when we have these better and great new products, they'll actually be broad-based distribution. So I, I don't plan to run away in the next year, so I kind of feel pretty good about that. And we're in f three, f three other provinces already selected for retail, so we're getting good at that whole vertical stack.